Well, let's pray. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. Lord, you are mighty. You are wonderful. We're here because we're hungry for you, Lord. And those watching, God, they're, they're desperate for a touch from you. So, God, we ask today that your hand would extend down to the hungry heart. Lord, that you would meet that one that's desperate for you in whatever place that they are. God, come and touch that person like only you can, Jesus. Encounter them in a way like they've never experienced. Father, as your word goes forth, it won't return void, Lord. And I know you'll meet those hungry and those desperate right where they are. God, I surrender to you, Lord. I, it's your service, God. These are, this is your word. It's your church. Everything belongs to you, Father. We lay it down at the altar today, God, for you to have your way, for your will to be done. And I pray a blessing over each one watching and each one here. Father, let you bless them. Let all their desires be met. Let their, their needs be met, Father. Whatever it is that they need, if it's healing, heal them, Lord. If they need deliverance, deliver them, Lord. If they need comfort, comfort them, Lord. If they need freedom, set them free. Whatever it is, God, do that thing for them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm glad to, to be here with you again today. It's always an honor to be preaching here at a place I've received so much. I honor Pastor Yeager. It's always a joy to be here in this house. Well, I have a word from the Lord for you today, and it's really for me too. And the, the title is Encountering God, but, but really the scripture that's assigned to it is Matthew 5, chapter 6. And it says, Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Amen. You shall be filled. I shall be filled. If what? I hunger and I thirst after righteousness. God's right way of doing things. If I hunger and thirst after Jesus, I'll be filled. So we're going to talk about that today, what it looks like. The differences between the different types of believers. The ones that hunger and the ones that don't. And I hope and pray today that you're going to be one that hungers by the time we're done. That you, If you aren't hungering now, I pray that you will be hungering when we finish this sermon. So turn with me. Let's look in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 to 4, about a man named Cornelius. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house. He gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him, saying to him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? He said unto him, Your prayers and your offerings are come up before as a memorial before God. Wow. Wow. That's powerful. His prayers, and it says his alms, his giving, came up before a memorial before God, it sounds to me like somebody like Matthew 5, 6. Blessed is he who hungers, who thirsts after God, for they shall be filled. That's what it sounds like to me. Let's look at verse 30 of that same chapter. This is where Cornelius is meeting up with Peter. Cornelius says, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, thy alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. And the 
The Lord sends Cornelius on an assignment. God is going to use Cornelius, this Gentile man, to go and meet with Peter to bring confirmation to a dream that Peter had. It's where God visits Peter and shows him that things are now clean, that we're unclean. But Peter struggled with that. He said, Lord, I have not touched the unclean thing. And Jesus says, don't call unclean what I have cleansed. For under the blood of Jesus, all things are now cleansed. You find it in verses 9 to 20 of that same chapter. Peter's trance, Peter's, Peter's vision. So you see, why Cornelius is the question I present to you. What was special about him? Why did God use him? How did he receive a visitation from an angel? Well, it was because he hungered. It was because he was thirsty for God to do something in his life. When you hunger and when you thirst, there's a visitation coming your way. Amen. There's an encounter coming your way. Amen. But it's not going to be for the unhungry. It's not going to be for those who aren't desperate. The lukewarm, the lazy Christian, it's not going to be for them. It's going to be for those who are desperate. For those who are hungry. For those who say, God, if I don't have you, I can't have anything. Lord, if you can't move in my life, I don't even want to live. God, burn in me like a fire. Shut up in my bones. Put the coal from the altar on my lips. Those are things that a hungry person says. Amen. And we see that because of Cornelius' hunger and his thirsting that was demonstrated by the way he lived, his giving and his, his prayers and his fasting, he's doing things that a hungry person does. A lazy believer is not going to fast. A lazy believer is not going to pray. A lazy believer is not going to give. But the one that says, I'm not going to be the average. I'm going to go farther with Jesus. I'm going to get desperate for God. And the angel comes to visit him. And now he's the one God uses to meet with Peter to confirm Peter's vision and dream about things now are not unclean. And even the, how the, go, the gospel was going to go to the, the whole world. That the spirit was going to come on all men. Cornelius is used. Why? Because he was hungry. Because he was thirsty. God visited him. Not only visited him. He's now used to confirm the dream that Peter had. And when they meet up in verse 34... Peter begins to preach concerning these things and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is not a respecter of persons. But in every nation that fears him and works righteousness is accepted by God. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say you know which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of these things which he both did in the land of the Jews in Jerusalem, whom they slay, and hanged on a tree. God raised him up the third day and showed him openly, but not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Verse 42. He commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in his name, 
shall receive remissions of sin. And in verse 44, when Peter preached these things, after Cornelius meeting with him and the confirmation coming, in verse 44, while Peter preached, it says, while he spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Amen. Amen. This is where the Holy Ghost falls on the Gentile, on all people, prophesied by Joel in chapter 2, verse 27. Joel chapter 2, verse 27. You shall know that I'm in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. My people shall never be ashamed. Verse 28. It shall come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days I will pour out my spirit. You see, this was a promise. This was prophesied by the Holy Ghost in the prophet Joel what was going to come on that day. And that day was an axe when the Holy Spirit fell in the upper room. That's the day. That's the latter rain. That's when all people could now be filled and carry the presence of God. They could carry the Spirit of God. You and I and those who believe and are hungry now walk with the DNA of Jesus inside of us. The Bible says the same Spirit that raised Christ from the ground, from the dead, lives in us. Who does it live in? The hungry, the thirsty, the desperate. But you see it here. This is the prophecy that it will come. But who does it come to? It comes to the thirsty. It comes to the hungry. It comes to the desperate. Today, I'm hungry for God. I... I think I'm six years into this journey with Jesus, for real. I bet people probably wonder, when's that guy going to give up? When's he going to throw in the towel? This is probably just some temporary fix. No, it's not. No, it's not. When God touches you, when you encounter Jesus, you're marked forever. I'm more hungry now than I was before. I'm getting hungrier now than I've ever been. Why? Because that fire... Shut up in my bones doesn't just go away. It doesn't just go out. No, it burns for a long time. I believe that thing will be burning in me right into eternity. Right when I leave this place, at whatever time that is, I'll, that fire will be burning. I'm going to keep it burning. You know, in 2 Chronicles, it says in verse 16, or chapter 16, verse 9, rather, that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, seeking someone on whom he could show himself strong on their behalf. Who's God seeking? He's seeking the hungry. He's seeking the desperate. He's seeking the thirsty. Why does it say it's a narrow road? Why does it say there are few be there that find it? The, 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 the reality is it's just there's few that are hungry. There's few that are thirsty. Most people are too busy for Jesus. They're too busy. They're offended. They don't care. They don't want Jesus. But God's looking for the few, those that will put down their pride and their sin and their rebellion and their shame and get hungry and say, God, I want more of you in my life. He's looking for those that will say, Jesus, you're the most important thing that I have. Everything else is nothing. Like, it was written, it says, all these things are vanity. That's who God's looking for. He's looking for the hungry. He's looking for the thirsty. He's looking for the desperate. Turn with me to Luke chapter 11. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Touch the hungry today, Lord. 
Meet them at that place of hunger. In dreams, in visions, in the night hour. Luke chapter 11, verse 9. And I say to you, ask, it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened to you. For every one that asks, receive. He that seek, find. And to him that knock, it shall be opened. Verse 11. If a son shall ask bread of you, that is a father, won't, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he instead give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? Verse 13, Jesus is saying, If you then, being evil in this world, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Right there, Jesus says, God's willing to give the Spirit to them that ask him. And can you also say to, to, to them that are hungry, to them that are thirsty, that's who gets the Spirit. That's who gets baptized in the fire of God. That's who gets filled with the presence of Jesus. That's who prays in tongues. The one that asks, the one that's hungry, the one that's thirsty, the one that's desperate. How many believers never get anything from Jesus? Because they stopped that, dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. And that was the end of it for them. They go on into the world and just live their life, never experiencing anything else of Jesus. Why? They had no hunger. They had no thirst. They weren't desperate for Jesus. They never received the Spirit in its full measure. They received just a little piece. But because of their lack of hunger, because of their lack of thirsting, and their lack of desire, they never tasted of the things of God. Few there be that find it. Why? Few there be that hunger, that thirst after God, after Jesus. I can think of the times in my life when God's encountered me. It was always in a time when I was hungry. Jesus never encountered me when I was lukewarm, when I was too busy in the things of the world to spend time with him, when I was too busy to pray, when I was too busy to go to church. Jesus never encountered me then. Never. But when I get on my knees and say, God, I'm hungry for you. I'm desperate. The things of this world are no longer satisfying me. Can you fill that void, Jesus? That was right what God was waiting for me to say. And God is waiting for some of you to do the same. How long will you live your life lukewarm, lonely, broken? Even though you believe in God, he seems distant from you. Even though you believe in Jesus, you have the necklace to prove it. But yet there's no real evidence that God lives in you. Can this be blamed on God? No. Can it be blamed on Jesus? Of course not. Is it the Holy Spirit's fault? I don't think so. We have to be hungry. We have to be thirsty. We have to be desperate. Or God's going to pass us over. Why? Because he's looking even now, wherever you are, he's looking. If God looked into your bedroom right now, would he, would he see that that's a place he wants to stop and encounter you? Or would he pass by and say, they're not hungry for me. They don't really want me. The things of this world are more important to them. Money is more important to them. They don't really want the things of my son Jesus. They don't really want to encounter my spirit. They don't really want to be filled. 
and overflowing. But don't let that be you, and it's not going to be me because others, that, that minority, that group, that small group says, no, I, that's not going to be me. I'm going to hunger after Jesus. I, I'm desperate for God. I can't live my life without him. I don't want to go on anymore as some fool without Jesus. I need Jesus in my life, and I believe you do too. So we have to be hungry. We have to be thirsty. And God will come, just like Cornelius, like Peter. So many that we're going to read about. You'll see how God came to encounter them. You don't have what you don't ask for. So many Christians are lacking in the things of God, the spiritual things. Most churches reject those things. And the reason is they're just not that hungry. They don't want to see demons cast out. They don't want to see people touched on the floor. They don't want to hear people pray in tongues. Why? They're not hungry. They like normalness. They like average things. But that's not what God's looking for in this hour. God's looking for those that say, I don't care what I look like. I don't care if I look like a fool. Jesus, burn in me. Take the coal off the fire and jam it in my mouth, Lord. Burn in me. The old prophets would say and the preachers would say, dip me in the kerosene of your spirit so I can burn for you. I believe it's some of the old tent revivals. People just went to see the man on fire for Christ. That's why they really went. Come and see a man on fire. Come and see the man on fire. But that came because that person was desperate for Jesus. That person was desperate for the Lord, for a touch, for a healing, for an encounter. It comes to the hungry. It doesn't come to everybody. Whether you believe or not, it comes to the hungry. It comes to the thirsty. It comes to those who are desperate for Jesus. Turn with me to first. Kings, chapter 3. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to your name, Jesus. Oh, Lord. I'm hungry for you today, God. Thank you, Lord. 1 Kings, chapter 3. And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David till he made an end of the building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord until those days and Solomon loved the Lord walking in the statutes of David his father only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places and the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon the altar. Verse 5. In Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said to him, Ask what it is I shall give to thee. Solomon was hungry. Solomon was thirsty for Jesus. He was desperate for the Lord to come on his behalf. And God, like he said, as he searches, he found Solomon. Why? Solomon gave up a thousand burnt offerings. There was no reason that he had to do that. He went out of his way and decided, he purposed in his heart, he was going to make a sacrifice unto the Lord. He was going to make an offering unto the Lord. Not just some small thing, but a thousand, a thousand offerings, one after another. 
But what did it do? It got God's attention. It got God's attention. Just like Cornelius, it said, your prayers, your giving, your fasting has come up before the Lord. What is it that you want? Solomon accessed heaven by what? His hunger, his desperation, his thirst. For Jesus. And God comes to him in a dream and says, Ask what I shall give thee. God comes and says, Whatever it is that you want, ask me. And it's yours. Because he hungered. Because he thirsted. He was desperate the things of God. Amen. And I believe even today, as you hunger, as you thirst, God has an encounter waiting for you. As you hunger and as you thirst, God has a dream waiting for you, but it hasn't come yet because you haven't been hungry. That thing that you're believing God for rests upon the fact of how how bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? You're not going to get it being lazy in your faith. The world's full of people that just aren't that hungry. They're not that desperate. But to those that are, God is coming. And he's coming fast. In dreams. In visions. In encounters. but he's waiting on you. Many people, God, why do you seem so far away? Why do you seem so distant from me, Jesus? I believed in you all my life, yet you seem so far away. Well, it's because that person's not hungry. They have no hunger. They have no desire. God is dull to them. Jesus is dull to them. The Holy Spirit is non-existent to that person. Because they don't hunger. They don't thirst. After the things of God. But you don't have to be that type of person. No, you can say, God, today, if you're not hungry, you say this even now. God, today I'm changing the way I hunger. I'm going to hunger after you. I refuse to continue Living on like a bump on a log, lukewarm, with all this sin in my life. God, I'm laying it down, and I'm going to hunger. I'm going to thirst that you come and encounter me. Some might need to do that. People know who they are. God is working on the hearts of man. I myself have been through these times where I knew that I'm, I'm starting to drift from God. He's starting to, to be farther from me. I, I could tell that something's wrong. I could see the warning signs. And I begin to say, no, no, I'm going to press back in. I'm going to make time to pray. I'm going to make time to fast. I'm going to make time to be in church. I'm going to make sure I'm on the front. I'm going to answer every altar call. I'm going to be so desperate that when God comes, he'll say, this one I'm encountering. This one is coming a dream. This one the healing is coming to. And we have so much evidence of that throughout the world. The hungry, the desperate, the thirsty, those are the ones that God visits. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, the Lord says, For them that honor me, I will honor. But to them that despise me or lightly esteem me, I will despise and I will lightly esteem. It's dangerous to not be on fire for Jesus. 
God doesn't play around with these things. Those who think whatever. Even Christians, well, whatever. God's also saying whatever. It says as you honor him, he honors you. It's like seed time and harvest. Whatever you sow, you'll reap. If you do nothing towards God, God does nothing back to you. And then people wonder, where are you, God, in the tragedy? Where are you when the relationship fell apart? Where are you in my addiction? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And God's silent on it because his response back would be, where were you? Where were you? You didn't honor me, but you expect me to honor you. You didn't esteem me, but you expect me to esteem you. No, God's not that way. He honors those who honor him. He comes to those who humble themselves. Everybody else, God will be nowhere to be found. He's looking for the hungry, the thirsty, the humble, the desperate. Make the changes that you need to make so God can come with that blessing, that healing, that vision, that dream that he's been desperately wanting to give. As you honor God, he honors you. What you put into it, you get back out. It only makes sense. It only makes sense. Let's quickly look at Mark chapter 4. And I've lived and walked out every one of these scenarios that I explained to you. I've been far away from God. As a believer, I've been broken and lukewarm. But I've also been on fire. And if I have the choice, which I do, I'm choosing to be on fire for God. I don't care what anybody else is doing. I really don't. Why? Because they're not going to stand with me when I stand before Jesus. I'll stand like you'll stand, by yourself, giving an account. And I want God to say to me, look, Colin, I know you, it was tough at times. You had a, to fight for wherever you, what you're doing. But I could see that you hungered and you thirst. You fought through the lukewarmness. You fought through the socially accepted normal gospel today, which is perverted. You pressed through that and said, no, Lord, I want the real thing. I don't want some fake gospel. I don't want some contaminated thing. I want the pure, holy word of God. Mark chapter 4 talks about Jesus had given a parable to them about seeds landing in different places. And in verse 14, he explains to them what he was talking about. He says, the sower sows the word. Mark chapter 4, verse 14. Then Jesus goes on to say that this word landed on the wayside. But when they heard, Satan immediately came and took the word from them that was sown in their hearts. Jesus is describing what happens as the preaching goes out. As his word goes forward, he's describing the different types of soil in that man's heart, how it lands and what happens. Verse 16, and this is like let the word lands on stony ground. They hear the word, immediately they receive it with gladness, but they have no root in themselves. And so they only endure for time. But when affliction or persecution come because of the word, immediately they're offended. Verse 18, these are they which are sown among thorns. They hear the word, but the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, lust of other things, enter in. Choke out the word, and it becomes useless. Verse 19. 
There's one last category Jesus describes. He describes four categories. We went through three. The last one is these which are sown on good ground. And it brings forth fruit, some 30, 60, and 100. Jesus was describing to them the four types today of four types of Christians. One out of the four actually is a positive report. The other three, it's not well for them. The first one immediately, the, the, Satan removes the word from their heart. They were happy for 30 seconds, and by the time they walked out the door, the word was gone. The other group, they, they have no root in themselves. And that word doesn't last very long. They're shaken too easy by persecution or whatever else. The other one was the word landed in the thorns. It landed in there, but the thorns, as you can imagine, they just grew up over it and choked it out, became unfruitful. And the last one, we know that it landed on good soil. And that word stuck, and it began to grow and take root steep down inside of you and I. What was the problem with the other three? The lack of hunger and thirsting after God. They didn't hunger. It wasn't hard for Satan to steal the word from someone that doesn't really care. It's easy for him to take it. You don't even have to try. The one that has no root, the second person Jesus talked about, you could say these are all believing people. The second one was they had no root. America's like that. We've never been shaken, but when it is, you'll see most Christians will fall off instantly. They'll be gone instantly. Why? They have no root. The American gospel doesn't work in other parts of the world where there's persecution. What was the problem there? What is the problem when they have no root? They have no hunger. They have no thirst after the things of God. Naturally, that's not going to hold up very well. And the last one is choked out by the lust of the things of this life, the pride of life. Like Hollywood, they just celebrate each other. They love each other. Like the Masonic movements, when you go in there, they, they, they greet each other with the highest praise. They worship each other. They're gods to themselves. Why? Because they never hungered after Jesus, so they found it somewhere else. Those who hunger and thirst shall be filled. Your life, your soul, really could depend on it. Your eternity may depend on the way you hunger after the things of God. Not everybody that starts out finishes the race. Jesus said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. What do you, want, what do you think that means? You have to decide for yourself. What do you think he's saying there? He that endures to the end shall be saved. I'll leave that one alone. You can think about that. Hungering and thirsting is when the encounters come. I can remember six years ago in a church. I sat in the very back. I didn't even want to be there. Really close to the door. I didn't really like it. They had an altar call. And I didn't want to answer it. I'm sitting in the back. And I know that I need to. I could feel it in my insides. I could feel my, I could feel God pulling on me to come, but I didn't want to come. Somebody came over and said, Colin, why don't you go up and answer that? I thought, oh man, I don't really want to. But okay. So I got up and I began to walk up the aisle. And I was ready to do business with God. I, as I walked up the aisle, I said, God, this is it. 
This is the last time I'm doing this. If you don't touch me now, if you don't encounter me now, Jesus, I'm done. There's no more church for me. There is no more of this or that. I'm finished after this, God. But, but I'm giving you a chance, Lord, and I'm desperate for you to touch me. And as I came up, I raised my hand like this. And I just remember being so desperate. I felt like I was coming out of my body. I was so hungry. <laughs> That's the only way I can describe it. <laughs> I was so desperate and I was so broken coming out of 15 years of alcoholism and addiction and relationships and pornography and smoking and stealing. And I had such a horrible way that I lived. I was so desperate. I was so tired of being so evil and corrupt. I wanted to be right. I wanted to experience Jesus. That's what was happening at that moment. I was just tired of being tired. I didn't want to be a sinner anymore. I was tired of it all. The world brought no satisfaction. And in that moment, the power of God came right down upon me with no one even around me. No one even prayed for me. No one even was near me. God himself just came. I remember my mouth started chattering. It felt like, it seemed like I was dipped into a bucket of ice cubes. I was like, <laughs> and I fell on the floor. Nobody prayed for me. Nobody pushed me. The power of God came. And I've never been the same since. But I sometimes wonder, what if I never would have got hungry that day? What would have happened to me? You probably would have, there probably would have been a headstone somewhere eventually where people would come and visit me. This is where he lies. He had everything going for him. He had money. He had friends. He had everything. But he didn't have Jesus. And this is what happened. But thanks be to God, that day I got hungry, I got desperate, and I came up here. I answered that altar call, and I've been marked for eternity ever since. Those who hunger, those who thirst, shall be filled. Let me quickly share one last scripture to close this out. In Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3, it talks about the different types of believers. In chapter 3, verse 13, or 14, it's talking to the church of Laodicea. In 15, it says, I know thy works. Thou neither hot or cold, but they're lukewarm. I wish they were hot or cold, but because they're lukewarm, I will reject them. I'll spit them out. This is a type of believer. And in Revelation 2, 4, chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Nevertheless, I have something against you. It's talking to Christians. Because you left your first love. Because you left your first love. What happened? They lost their hunger. Verse 5, remember therefore where you've fallen from and repent. Do the first works or else I'll come quickly and remove thy candlestick from its place except thou repent. Jesus said, I have this against you. You left your first love being him. What was the problem? They lost their hunger. They lost their thirst. They lost their desperation. Don't let that become you. Hunger and thirst for Jesus and that encounter will come. Hunger and thirst. And that thing that you believe, that you're believing God for, will come. Amen.